uh, Rudra, dear friends, uh, let me say it's good to be back at GTS uh, and I'm looking forward uh, to this year's uh, session as well. Uh, I thought uh, perhaps uh, what I could do in terms of uh, introducing this year's GTS was to uh, give a larger context of where India stands today uh, in regard to technology in the broadest possible sense because uh, that's how you really approach it in terms of public policy before of course drilling down uh, very much more specifically. Now we all uh, intuitively know that the march of technology uh, is really the history of human progress and actually pretty much every era has its uh, particular sets of uh, technological advancements uh, which have uh, defined it. And we also know that the history of the world, uh, the balances of power, uh, the making and unmaking of nations, of civilizations, is all in one way or the other uh, uh, a reflection uh, of uh, how technology uh, has grown. Now, in terms of the policy challenges that it presents, uh, one, of course, is the need to regulate technology uh, because uh, many technologies also come with their downsides. Uh, uh, and uh, we have seen that expressed in world affairs through uh, regimes and uh, treaties and rules. Uh, and uh, there are some which are uh, very obvious, as we've seen, uh, let's say, nuclear or missile. Uh, there are many which uh, are managed through understandings and uh, uh, conventions. Uh, but a second concern is, of course, the competitive aspect of technology, uh, that those who lead the world lead the world's technologies. Uh, and uh, to the extent that there are leaders, sometimes even monopolizers, uh, there are consequences uh, of that. And uh, what has perhaps changed in a uh, recent perhaps decade has been that while technology was always a determinant, uh, the interpenetrative capability of technology has actually grown, which is it is not just that it shapes our lives, but in a very individual sense, uh, across all the uh, the conceptual barriers that we all have in our minds, barriers of privacy, barriers of community, barriers of nation state, uh, technology today has shown its ability to go through all of that. So in many ways today, uh, to the extent we look at a post-Westphalian world uh, where the nation state is not always the determining element of any assessment, uh, much of it, the responsibility actually arises out of uh, the technologies with which uh, we are all grappling. Now, where India is concerned, uh, I think today uh, we are in many areas very clearly playing catch up. We are playing catch up because uh, while uh, our era of reform started uh, three decades ago. The era of reform was not necessarily the era of technology. That we conceptualize reform in much narrower terms. Uh, we were perhaps not as ambitious and as expansive as we should have been. Uh, so uh, a lot of it uh, ended up in a very narrowly defined economics. Uh, much of it centered around trade and to some degree investment. And the, the kind of effort which uh, other uh, powers, some competitive, put in terms of developing the comprehensive national power, uh, that same drive and determination uh, was not there, very honestly, where India was concerned. And if I were today to sum up the last decade, because uh, I think we are now very clearly uh, at the uh, tail end of what is the second term of the Modi government. 
perhaps one major difference has been the centrality of technology uh, to uh, approach towards public policy and to approach towards governance uh, and towards national security. So uh, if one uh, looks today uh, at the domestic direction, the push uh, on manufacturing, and this itself is a debate in this country. There are people who believe that it is not our, uh, our competence, I would say even our karma, to do manufacturing. Uh, and that, you know, we would be wasting our time, energy, and resources embarking on that path. But here's a common sense proposition. You're not going to be able to do R&D if you don't have a competitive manufacturing. You can't encourage people to be at the cutting edge if you are not at the middle level of the same business. The second uh, is the uh, growth of a startup culture. A startup culture because what were the innovative, uh, uh, the innovative expressions of a few? A startup culture is able to expand that and actually build it into the mindsets uh, of a society. The, the third reflection of that is actually uh, state leading uh, at least some critical parts of that. Uh, I think if I were to cite an example today, uh, it would be the semiconductor mission. Uh, still in the very early stages, uh, but one which I assure you we are deadly serious about. Uh, and uh, finally, of course, uh, which Rudra also mentioned, uh, the, the entire, uh, I would say, uh, today the effort in, in building and delivering on a digital public infrastructure. Uh, what uh, Prime Minister likes to call the democratizing of technology. The technology, today the average person not only uses it but relates to it. Uh, and uh, of course the figure which we like to tout, tout out is the one relating to the uh, UPI the, the massive volumes of UPI transaction, which shows how readily people take to technology uh, once it is there uh, on offer. Now, while there have been undeniably enormous changes on the domestic side, uh, technology has also been very much uh, in the forefront uh, of diplomacy, of uh, foreign policy. Uh, it is today, uh, I would say, uh, uh, reflected uh, in how often we talk to our partners uh, about re reliable and resilient supply chains and what would be India's uh, role uh, in that uh, uh, new sets of chains that are being built. Or, in fact, in the conversations about critical and emerging technologies, uh, and it could have, you know, uh, cascading impact in other areas. So, I mean, I find, uh, particularly in the last year, many more countries are interested in mobility uh, discussions because the world of technology is also accelerating the world of mobility. Uh, so, uh, I would, uh, you know, I know that there's a lot that you will all be discussing. Uh, at the moment, of course, one a uh, particular area of interest uh, is uh, the the debate uh, about responsible AI. And I was very pleased today when I was in parliament to learn from my colleague Rajiv Chandrasekhar that he will be speaking uh, to you about it, I think, tomorrow or day after, uh, that he is absolutely the right person uh, where the government is concerned for uh, that particular subject. Uh, overall, I would say, uh, when it comes to technology, uh, today the challenge as it is in much of international relations is how to compete, but how to compete with responsibility. Uh, so that uh, is, and an responsibility and competition do not always easily go together. Uh, so that I see as today one of the biggest challenges uh, in uh, international relations. So when I look at the broad set of issues that you will be talking about, uh, for me, a lot, much of that comes to 
managing it at a interstate level and at a multilateral uh, level. So uh, I really look forward to your energetic discussions and then try to see where uh, the derived wisdom from that is useful for me. Once again, I thank you all for being here and for having the patience to listen to me once again. Thank you. Dr. Jayashankar, thank you so much. There's a lot in those notes for us to unpack. Perhaps I could start by asking you a slightly broader question. In 2016, you had some kind of a geopolitical conception in mind when the various con conversations on technology started and the geopolitics of sort of technology. The GTS is perhaps one small derivative of that. Um, could you give us a sense of what those conceptions were back in 2016 and how have they changed, if at all, as you sit here for the eighth edition? Uh, you know, when we started this, I'm not sure. Yeah, is, you're good, is, This is working. Okay. Uh, when we started it, actually, I think multiple factors drove it. Uh, one was a very simple proposition, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, the Prime Minister actually actively encouraged forums in India, uh, which he felt would be useful, uh, impactful, both in getting Indians a wider exposure to what the world is thinking, but more important, to get the world to focus a little bit more on what India was thinking. So that, and that was a generic, uh, shall I say, uh, encouragement. So it wasn't just GTS, a number of other uh, platforms came up at the same time. The second, as I mentioned, is actually the centrality of technology uh, to governance, because I think very early on, there was a belief that uh, if we are to, uh, to really rapidly progress, if we are to leapfrog, uh, you know, everybody has, I mean, the history of the world countries have leapfrogged by actually using a pathway. Uh, which is faster, smoother, more efficient, more impactful than the pathways used by others. So uh, a lot of us could see even by 2016, I mean, what today we call DPI. I mean, this DPI was long in the making. In fact, I remember something which Nandan has written, uh, which was that when he went around uh, the country talking to chief ministers about Aadhaar, he said the only chief minister who gave him complete and utter attention was the chief minister of Gujarat who put every other business away and then spent hours with him, uh, you know, figuring out where all this could go. Uh, so uh, the, I think the centrality of technology to better governance, to good governance uh, was a second uh, factor. The third, honestly, was my own uh, belief. Uh, you know, uh, that, uh, again, uh, this is a pre-digital era uh, belief that uh, uh, if one looks at uh, history in terms of quantum jumps, uh, that jump to the next orbit is usually uh, uh, based on a particular technology or a set of technologies which have actually changed uh, uh, the framework. Uh, and, in fact, my own... Uh, PhD was really what did nuclear technology, what did the promise of nuclear technology, uh, even as the Second World War was taking place, do to the behavior of powers in dealing with each other? And after the war ended, uh, after the uh, first two bombs were dropped, uh, how every other, na you know, the other relevant nations actually saw in that technology uh, uh, sort of key factors which would uh, advance uh, their prospects. But I think a whole set of these things came together. Uh, and uh, of course, it was also helpful that I could uh, bounce it off Raja Mohan at that time. And that's really how the conference started. If I can pick up one or two strands from there, India has a pretty incredible digital journey that's very clear. We seem to be embarking now on a kind of a new era if lack of a better term, slightly higher up in the value chain mm -hmm. when it comes to manufacturing. You've spoken and often wrote about re-globalization. Now, to me, re-globalization would mean the deconcentration of economic production in any one geography or jurisdiction. 
opening our pathways, better supply chains, etc. Could you give us a sense of how do you see reglobalization today? Uh, I think uh, you have put your finger on on the key issue, which is over concentration. Uh, that uh, what had happened really, I'd say, between 1990s till the COVID, uh, was uh, that uh, for a very wide variety of uh, goods, uh, technologies, and even services, uh, we had actually all become dependent on a single geography. And it really took the COVID to wake up the world. Uh, it woke up the world because if the dependence was, I would say, at the cutting edge, we would have still probably rationalized it, though actually that is the part which should be causing the most concern. But because the dependence was actually very basic, that, you know, if, it, if, if, if the rest of the world couldn't even figure out how to get enough masks and uh, ventilators and PPEs, by that, and that's when it really hit home to people that maybe something hasn't gone right with the way the world has gone. So once the, you know, that, those two, three years, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, anxieties and pressures and stresses that pretty much every country went through in the world, uh, I think it's, it's fundamentally changed uh, uh, the global conception of how a globalized economy should be run. You know, a globalized economy doesn't mean uh, that production gets done at the center and everybody else is a consumer. Uh, a globalized economy means dispersed uh, production. Uh, it means enough, uh, enough uh, plan Bs and Cs, not where things to go wrong, if things, when things go wrong, because it will certainly go wrong. So the more we realize, you know, I mean, pandemic was one. I think we've had climate events uh, uh, happening with greater regularity. We've seen conflicts which have disrupted uh, the, uh, the international uh, trade flows. So we've, you know, our understanding of disruptions has become sharper. Our worries about concentrated production is greater. I think you put two and two together and you will arrive at the need for a re-globalization. Now, I'm not saying re-globalization is happening. I'm saying that that's really what we should be aiming for. Uh, and uh, if key countries understand it, and if enough businesses understand it, uh, they, will, they will take the world in that direction. It will not happen overnight. It may not even happen volumetrically, which is, uh, you know, that the a large part of global manufacturing gets spread all over the world. But it may happen in sensitive areas. Uh, that uh, you, 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 That's why this whole stress today uh, on uh, reliable and resilient uh, supply chains. If India, and India is, and you've laid out a vision in the keynote that you gave, especially on semiconductors, but it definitely seems to many of us from the outside that in fact the government is more than deadly serious. And you know, we just had a big company that broken ground in Gujarat. The hope is that ecosystem will grow even further. But for re-globalization, Minister of says there seems to be at least two preconditions. One is internal to us, which is that are we in the place where we can absorb the disruptions that are taking place in other parts of the world and make the best of them? And the other is perhaps what we're already doing or what we see from the outside is forging new partnerships. Uh, I would say a kind of a, a partial yes to both, but uh, very much work in progress. I mean, uh, I, uh, you know, what happens often, uh, and it's, it's, very, it's a very human habit. We tend to compare benchmark ourselves against our own past. So we would say, yes, it's easier to do business because it's better today in 2023 than it was in 2018, which is better than 2013 and whatever. But beyond the point, that doesn't cut much ice because the, the investor is not really looking at you against yourself. They are looking at you against uh, competitors. 
So uh, clearly, it's one area where we need to keep improving our uh, openness and our, uh, uh, I would say, uh, ability to be credible as a manufacturing uh, location. Uh, it isn't just the business rules. I think a large part of it uh, is also uh, the nature of the workforce. Uh, to the extent that uh, today the emphasis is much more on, you know, the kind of emphasis we have seen on skill development, uh, on innovation, on book, you know, on training. Uh, these are relatively new in India. I mean, they are less than a decade old and there's a long way to go here. I mean, if one where to do a workforce comparison, we will not necessarily come out well from it. Uh, so uh, I would say, therefore, uh, yes, there is a, a lot that we could do, but at some stage you've got to start doing it. You know, We don't want to go to the other extreme and say, oh, we're no good at it, so let's not even have a shot at it. And there are people who are peddling that narrative as well. So uh, to me, how do we uh, you know, uh, go along this path as effectively and uh, sort of seriously as we can. So you had a number of uh, pieces here. You've had this production linked incentive uh, initiative. Uh, as I said, you had uh, an expansion of technical education, uh, a much more serious uh, skilling program, an easier to do uh, business uh, uh, approach, and easier uh, a de bureaucratizing uh, of the system in a way, what we call ease of living. Uh, so there are whole, you know, there are a lot of moving parts here which need to come together. Many of them have come together, uh, but there's a long way to go here. The other part of it is uh, the international partners. Now, uh, here what happens is uh, the politics of technology uh, actually is not congruent uh, uh, necessarily with the politics of uh, geo strategy or the politics of culture, uh, or the politics of uh, um, post-colonial uh, preferences and antipathies. So uh, it, uh, I mean, if one looks uh, today at where are your preferred partners, uh, for a country like India, it's not an easy question to answer, because your preferred partners depends on which domain you are looking at. Uh, depending on the domain, you will have uh, a set of partners, many of whom would overlap, but many of whom would not. And I have always been uh, clearly advocative of the fact that when it comes to technology in the broadest possible sense, uh, really our uh, natural partner uh, are uh, the economies of the Western, uh, uh, you know, our Western economies. Uh, and if you see today, I mean, which is why, I mean, Quad has been helpful. Uh, the TTC with the EU has been helpful. Uh, these are, these are our, uh, I would say, technology partners. They are our markets in a way. They are our investors in different ways. Uh, these are also places where uh, the mobility which, from which this country can also benefit, the skills development would happen. Uh, so I would certainly say there is a big agenda there uh, for, for particularly in respect of uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, and Europe. If I could just pick up the point about the U.S., um, there are some who would argue that the agenda over the last couple of years and everything that you framed here would push us to some kind of overdependence. Now maybe there's a different way of thinking about that and it's certainly not my view. But there seems to be a view that there is, that this dependence, interdependence is a difficult game. And there seems to be that we are in a spot where there may be a bit too much over-dependence. I was just wondering, how do you think, and perhaps I could ask you for one more is, you know, you've often said that technology is as much about political science. If different political formulations were to develop in Western countries that we're dealing with today, would that dislodge any of the agenda setting that we're trying to put in place today? Uh, uh, give me the second one again. Maybe I'll try and be as, is maybe more direct. Uh, if there's, I, <laughs> I thought I was the diplomat in the room, but uh, yeah, yeah. if there's a different political makeup in the U.S. by next year this time, and if different forces change in Europe, for instance, does that by in any way jeopardize 
our technology path and the investments that we're making in the partnership with the United States or others? Uh, the first question, are we getting over-dependent? You know, usually I find over-dependence is a rationalization of inaction, uh, which is you don't want to do something, you say, oh, don't do it, because if you do it, you'll get over-dependent. Secondly, I've noticed that the over-dependence argument is very, it's a very curious argument. You use it against some countries, but not apparently against other countries. Uh, look at India's trade figures and tell me where are we over-dependent? I can tell you where we are over-dependent, the, the accounts where we have enormous trade deficits and where often we are dependent on for very basic things. But that's not where you hear the over-dependence argument. So, you know, uh, sometimes uh, I, technology could be political science, but politics sometimes masquerades as uh, uh, national security as well. I think people have, there are ideological agendas, and those ideological agendas are, if you move too closely towards a certain set of countries, that is over-dependence. But if you do the same with other set of countries, it's not over-dependence. But put that aside. The uh, issue, if there are changes uh, in uh, uh, the US, political changes in the US or in Europe, does that make a difference? My considered sense is no. I'll tell you why. Look at the data. Okay. Let's take the US. So we can argue about the inflection point for the latest, uh, you know, for where we have arrived. Uh, I would say one inflection point would be 2000, Clinton coming here. One would be 2005, uh, nuclear deal. One could be maybe 2014, Modi's visit. And one definitely, I would say, was this visit because the, this visit of Modi's was the most expansive, uh, ambitious uh, in terms of spelling out the cooperation. Now, the interesting thing about the U.S. is you actually had five completely different presidents. I mean, think Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden. Now, if a relationship can actually uh, prosper, uh, with five very different presidents. I would suggest to you that the data clearly indicates uh, a certain uh, sort of uh, uh, stability and a certain, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a, uh, enough investment on both sides in, in there's a certain structural uh, soundness uh, to this relationship. So I don't, uh, I, you know, I'm not saying politics doesn't matter. Of course it does. Uh, I, you know, the arguments could be different, that, uh, you know, the nature of negotiations could be different. But I think today, uh, I'm now giving you an Indian view of it, uh, an American view of it, maybe couched in a different way. But I think today, from an Indian perspective, India-US relations is certainly proofed against uh, political uh, change. Uh, where Europe is concerned, I think we are, frankly, much less of an issue there. You know, uh, the, you know, there's less community there in terms of their own uh, calculations. We are less salient. So I do not really see us even being a subject of debate. You know. So I'm quite confident that uh, because I can, you know, we can all see changes will come. I mean, uh, some developments in Europe have shown that you can have ups and downs. And it's in the nature of democracy as well uh, that uh, things like that can happen. But I'm pretty confident that uh, certainly a large part of the uh, India-US and India-Europe conversations on technology, uh, and not just on technology, actually on strategic uh, convergence and shared strategic interests. Uh, I think they are well-proofed against the politics of the day. Minister, if I could pick up the question on Europe. Is Europe clearly, I mean, from what we make out from the outside and we read you and others, is that Europe played a central role in, in a conceptualization of what, you know, you often refer to as a multipolar world, multi-vector world in its sense. Last year, this time, the UTTC existed but it was yet to be fleshed out. 
you had a very high level meeting this summer where now there's an agenda for action. Could you give us a sense of how that unfolds on the, in the, on the TTC side? Uh, you know, the uh, idea of a TTC uh, came from uh, actually uh, uh, President von der Leyen when she was visiting uh, India. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's an interesting proposal. There was one which they, the Europe, EU had done with the US. Uh, but, you know, the nature of the U.S.-EU relationship is significantly different. It's a far more mature, advanced relationship uh, than ours is. Uh, but uh, we've done uh, two sessions so far. Uh, we did one in Brussels, uh, and we just did one a few days ago, uh, virtually. Uh, and uh, uh, we are hoping very much to do a physical one early next year. And... Uh, it's been very helpful because uh, a we really didn't have see unlike with the U.S. You know, with the, with the U.S., we've had a long conversation uh, on uh, strategic trade. Uh, in fact, a conversation which goes back to the early 80s to the Reagan administration, uh, and the first agreement which we uh, did with the U.S. Uh, was as long back as 1984. Uh, so, uh, so in our, you know, for us, uh, export control, uh, licensing, these have always been big subjects uh, with the U.S. Uh, with Europe, that has never been uh, high on the radar. Uh, so, today, when we are moving uh, to uh, an era where uh, control on technologies and strategic trade is making a comeback. Uh, I think it's crucial. Uh, we have that conversation partly because India is both a bigger consumer and generator of technology, uh, partly because Europe's uh, relevance on that has gone up, and uh, also because the India-EU relation, you know, the, the the volumes of India EU trade and investment have gone up. So, uh, so there was a good case. It was a, I think, a very, uh, very uh, sort of uh, uh, well-timed European initiative. We were very glad to respond, and uh, I do think you know this is something which will go forward. You brought up uh, export controls, Minister. We're glad to know that we have about uh, 30 U.S. officials who are here for GTS, so perhaps a bit too much for our team to deal with, mm -hmm. but they're here and we're very glad that they are. And I see Jonathan Finest sitting here as well. Um, to do, and a lot of them are here to do a series workshops, various workshops with our companies, MSMEs, startups. Many of our startups, as you mentioned in the keynote, now have serious capability, especially in space, dual use AI. And there's a kind of a, not a new, but there's a renewed conversation perhaps between the two sides in terms of us knocking on the, on their doors to access technology, licensing. Some of it is just getting through ambiguity in its sense. But one part that sometimes comes up in these conversations is on the, especially on the export control side, is, is the highlight of over-dependence that we have with another jurisdiction, such as Russia, for instance. And I was just wondering if you can give us a sense when and if this war ends, how do you see our relationship and our military dependence on Russia panning out over the next many years? You know, look, uh over, uh, you know, again, I put it to you, over-dependence is a very, very loaded term. Huh? Uh, it's what you use when you don't want the other guy to do something. Okay. When you want them to do it, you never talk about it. I mean, uh, again, uh, we have a relationship with Russia. It's not a relationship which happened in one instant, one day, one month, one year. It is an accumulated relationship of uh, close to 60 years. And it's a relationship which happened because the, the direction of world politics uh, during those 50, 60 years uh, actually uh, forged, helped forge that uh, relationship. So, uh, because, you know, often I see the problem defined in a way as though somewhere there's some handicap that India has by having this relationship. This relationship has saved us at times. So, uh, you know, uh, whether we are over-dependent or not, actually at the end of the day depends on us. You know, if we have multiple partners, if we have the, you know, partly the skills to play them off, but we play them off while 
keeping good you know maintaining the level of uh, uh, trust and confidence with each one of them if if i have four good relations which are all working well i'm not dependent on any of them i'm certainly not over dependent on any of them so uh, i mean do understand this that you know partly there is a lot of uh, history and uh, you know the weight uh, the the force of that which has been uh, today uh, a defining aspect of the india russia relationship secondly there is a you know it's like strategy 101 i mean if you look at the eurasian land mass uh, just looking at the map it makes sense that india and russia would have strong relations because it it is in accordance with the first uh, principle of politics of your neighbor's neighbor so uh, so for us uh, there is a a lot of logic to it but what had happened in the past was uh, uh, you know uh, we ended up in a situation i'm not assigning responsibility for it where our own options were constrained okay uh, what in the last uh, 30 years uh, uh, that has widened and certainly i would assert in the last 10 years it has widened even more now as you have more options it's natural for a country to make the best of it and to make the best of it you then become very considered and deliberate and judicious about which option you exercise in which domain to what extent and that in a way today is what indian foreign policy is about i mean it has become more complicated to to practice uh, simply because actually my my landscape has widened my options have widened i have become bigger uh, my footprint has grown bigger so i have to somewhere get you know it's like having a small portfolio versus a huge portfolio the portfolio has got bigger i will find a balance if i find a balance i'm not over dependent let me ask you a somewhat prosaic question when portfolios become larger we need more resources and capacities um and this is this question gets asked often of political leaders and ministers about you know are we doing enough on capacity but on question of this geopolitics of technology there are so many shifts taking place we are involved in so many conversations across the world there is reglobalization to an extent that's actually happening in manufacturing other places we're seeing movement in data we're seeing changes in digital public infrastructure for something that few knew last year to now we're thinking about global south quad etc is our is your ministry if i may ask a ministry that today perhaps needs to change to deal with the different kinds of capacity not just in terms of numbers but the complexity of the ecosystem we are now working uh okay uh, you said rudra at the beginning that you know in the last year so many things have happened okay so we must have done something right right okay. now if we had such uh, severe constraints and yet we did so many things right either we are exceptionally smart uh, i don't want to say that about myself or we have found a working style uh, uh, methodology Uh, which actually allows us to harness uh, you know many more forces uh, in society so uh, look nobody nobody in charge of any organization would say my organization uh, cannot grow all of us would like to grow it's it's uh, uh, it's a self interest out there uh, but i have the limitations not not of indian diplomacy not of the indian foreign service i have the uh, limitations of an entire indian governance structure you know if i was not the the foreign minister let us say if i was a minister of some other department i'm sure you could say the same of that department as well i would mean, you would say well maybe they're not enough policemen in india they're not enough customs people in india they're not enough income tax guys in india all of which would probably be true but what happens is since i cannot uh, dramatically change it i actually have over the years uh, uh, found ways by which 
I use smart people like you to get a lot of my work done. You know, in, in a lot of other societies, uh, there wouldn't be a GTS. Some foreign ministry would be organizing uh, an event like this. They wouldn't get such nice people to come there. Uh, so I, I think there is, there is a certain, um, I would say, a certain way of working which has developed over the years. Because uh, forget the numbers for a moment. Tell me the outcomes. I mean, if you were to say, you know, Minister, your performance in the last five years has been terrible. You were missing at all the important moments. You didn't have enough people to attend meetings. You couldn't do the G20 properly. I don't know what you did when you went to the Security Council. You are invisible in the world. Yes, I would then maybe take your numbers uh, explanation very, very seriously. But if you tell me, oh, by the way, you did this, 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 I still think you have a numbers problem. Uh, then <laughs> I think that's a perfect answer. You brought up the G20 and as we kind of move to closing the conversation, it's been an incredible year for India. Um, I mean, I think the involvement of various networks of people, ecosystems, and you just reflected on the government's different ways of working with people, using different ecosystems, working with them. It was really, literally the kind of people's G20 as we saw it here. Um, you've spoken of the G20 in the context also of an expression of a more dynamic form of multilateralism and a good expression and perhaps good empirical example of how that dynamism can really come to bear. How do we sustain this process going ahead and as we now hand over the baton um, to Brazil and beyond? Uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm now getting a little ahead of myself, but let us say two, three, four years from now, if one looks back at this G20, I suspect that uh, the three reasons it would be remembered would be one, the fact that it put uh, DPI, uh, Digital Public Infrastructure, center stage in terms of a global developmental narrative. Number two, I think it refocused attention on the fact that we are falling behind on SDGs in the most alarming way and that, uh, you know, it was something which had been, uh, the other events, more compelling events had uh, pushed that to the side. And number three, uh, I would say it would be remembered as uh, one major step of uh, reforming the global order where Africa actually got a place. Uh, now, how do we take it forward? To some extent, I think the G20 structure helps us uh, because it's a Troika driven structure. So we made sure that every step of the way, whatever we did, we copied the Brazilians. So when the baton, the baton has been handed over to them, it's seamless. I mean, they, they know everything we know. Uh, and, uh, and we remain attached as now as a Troika member uh, to that. Uh, and it's also helpful uh, that uh, South Africa follows after uh, Brazil because uh, again, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we certainly, uh, as the hosts and the prime movers of the G20, uh, a lot of what, you know, the diplomacy which happened centered around us. But I must say uh, that uh, to a great degree, Brazil and South Africa, particularly when we were close to the last mile, were helpful in forging because finally, look, the G20 came together, you know. Uh, I mean, every one of the G20 members uh, in some way or the other did something to buy into the outcome document. And many of them had very strong positions. So we have to also give them credit that for a larger cause, for a, uh, for a bigger message, many of them actually made adjustments to their position. You know, I, I, I think uh, this is a... Uh, this is a, a, a kind of a, a global happening which should not uh, be lightly uh, disregarded. So uh, everybody did their share, but I would say 
uh, we, the next two, uh, the Brazil, South Africa, we were very much at the heart of what happened in that last uh, last uh, uh, phase. So I'm very confident that you know the the uh, kind of the traditions, the culture, the getting. Uh, things together. I actually forgot to add the fourth, uh, which was really IFI reform. Uh, it didn't happen in Delhi, uh, but I think the Marrakesh meeting uh, in October, which ha which happened the month after, uh, is hugely consequential. We haven't seen the full uh, import of that play out, uh, but I I would say again, uh, if we if we do see uh, uh, really. Uh, uh, a big push in terms of uh, development funding uh, in the world, uh, especially uh, green funding. Uh, I think people would look back and say, okay, a lot of that goes uh, to what happened uh, at the Marrakesh uh, Finance Minister's meeting. No, thank you, Minister. To close out, if I can ask, you joined the Foreign Service, if I got my math right, 46 years ago. Yeah, yes. <laughs> in 2019, you became our 30th foreign minister. What were the opportunities, if I can just ask, that you saw perhaps in 2019? And what are the opportunities that you see today um, as you're close to closing out your first term as the foreign minister and hopefully many more terms? Um, <laughs> but what are the opportunities that you see for India today looking at the next few years? You know, uh, look, uh Coming in in 2019, I had the experience of being foreign secretary before that. Uh, then fortunately, a bit of a break which helped me to get a better understanding of how business really works. Uh, so we came in, uh, you know, obviously, you know, with a lot of uh, ideas, uh, a great deal of ambition, I would say, uh, because uh, the first term had uh, put in place many, you know, at least many of the concepts which we wanted to take forward in the second term. And, you know, it could be uh, concepts in terms of how do you prioritize the world, you know, a neighborhood, an extended neighborhood, uh, key partners, areas of interest, uh, you know, take the quad further. You know, there, there were a whole set of issues out there. Uh, when I look coming to the end of the term, uh, uh, I would say what obviously we didn't see coming, uh, no, none of us saw the COVID coming and how transformational COVID would be. Uh, co you know, we look in terms of our own lifestyles, but certainly in terms of what it has done to the world's thinking uh, about, about the world, uh, it's hugely consequential. Uh, second, uh, we Obviously, uh, this is an India uh, issue particularly. Uh, I, again, uh, very, it, it would have been very difficult to foresee the downturn of our relations with China. Uh, and what the consequences of that uh, actually have been uh, to our national security and uh, diplomacy. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, the Ukraine conflict. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, though I would argue that could and to some degree was foreseen. You know, it was a, it was like a long goodbye, uh, but that that goodbye was evident uh, even before uh, 2019. Uh, and uh, of course, now what what we are seeing in in West Asia. So, uh, if in these uh, five years you had five six such globally consequential events. It's clearly a very, very different world that uh, we are looking at. But my, uh, my uh, sort of considered self-assessment would be uh, that in each case, you know, we have, we have sought to absorb the event, uh, respond in the most effective way, even where possible, use it to to uh, to advance or to gain uh, in in some manner, and I think if you use these five uh, you know five events, and this is from an Indian perspective, really the COVID, the China relationship, the Afghanistan issue, the uh, the conflict in uh, Ukraine, the Middle East, I think put together, I would 
overall say that uh, we haven't done a bad job.